Hello and welcome to my show, No Filter. Joining me today is economist Parakara Prabhakar, who recently said that the electoral bond scheme is not just the biggest scam in India, but it's the biggest scam globally. Today, I'll be talking to him about the electoral bond scheme and about the problem of unemployment. Thank you very much for joining me, Mr. Prabhakar. You said that uh, electoral bond scheme is the biggest scam globally. Why did you feel so? Oh, you know, the, 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 the kind of uh, things that slowly and slowly that we are now learning as the data is coming out and people like you and so many other people who are independent, you know, they are putting one and one to, together. And look at the quantum of money involved, that is one. The second thing is the, the, the number of agencies that are involved, the government agencies that were uh, used. Not only that, you know, a, an organization which is supposed to be fiercely independent and presides over the fiscal and financial destiny of the country like the Reserve Bank of India, even institutions like that were also compelled to water down their criteria and do favors to uh, banks and institutions and individuals and investors who have, you know, copiously, liberally donated to the ruling party. The quantum of money involved and the number of agencies involved and the spread. You know, it, it's not that, you know, uh, some money is taken and some favor is granted. It is deliberately raiding them, coercing them, and taking, extorting money out of them. It's not just, you know, normally corruption used to be, you, uh, you they wanted a contract or the, somebody wanted a favor and you take some money, the government and the political parties or leaders might do that. But this is institutionalized. You have used institutions. And that is why I say it is, the biggest scam, unprecedented in its scale, unprecedented in using the institutions. I would call this the Modi gate. It is the Modi gate and the way it is being unraveled. And, you know, why did the government fight so hard to stop this from coming out. It fought so hard. In fact, at one stage, the government made the its highest law officer tell the Supreme Court, the highest judicial forum of our country, that the people of India have no right to know how their political parties are funded. You know, they went to that extent. And then, when the Supreme Court has put, it foot, put its foot down and said nothing doing this has to be revealed, you give the data to the Election Commission of India and the Election Commission of India will have to publish this. You know, just about a day or so before the deadline, the State Bank of India goes back to the court and says that it wanted time until after the elections. And then... Even that was not accepted by the court. When that was not accepted by the court, they had given partial data. One year of data they, they withheld. You know, what, does it, what does it all tell you? It tells you that you, know, uh, you, you smell a rat in this. You, you sense that you know, the government has something to hide. They, because they, 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 have, they, want some, they want to hide it because it will come back to them and expose them, expose their corruption because they came to power in 2014 riding a wave against corruption. They said they would provide a clean government. They, are, they were against the corruption. They would give jobs. They would bring the black money back. But, you know, all this, the entire narrative is now stands exposed. That is the reason why I say 
this is the biggest scam in India, not only in India, but in the entire world because of the scale. And that is the reason why I call this a Modi gate. So uh, because you mentioned about black money, Home Minister Amit Shah was asked at a media conclave. That's where we see them most of the time now. In this conclave, he said that electoral bonds were a scheme which was brought to ensure that there is no black money in political funding. And now that the scheme has been struck down, black money will be back into politics. A lot of people do see the scheme as white money, right? Uh, like I put out a tweet saying this is money laundering. And almost every single big handle of the right wing came to say that I don't understand economics because how can it be uh, money laundering since it's all entered in the books of the companies. So this is what the Home Minister says. And this is what the rest of them say, that this is white money. This is not money laundering. This was supposed to stop black money. Um, you see, uh, such um, attempts at justifying this could probably wash, provided it is transparent, number one. Because, you know, except the bank and except, and through the bank, the ruling government or ruling party, except them, nobody knows who is buying and who is giving what to whom and uh, who is encashing them. Nobody else knows. That is one. Uh, the second thing, Danya, is, you know, um, not only that, you know, there is no transparency, but, you know, the timing, when was it given, why was it given, they also, there is, there is absolutely no idea. Then the third dimension is that now when you, when the data is out now, you can see that firms, the profit of the firm, the there used to be a cap. You know, you, you cannot part with more than a certain percentage of your profits for political donations. Now, that is lifted, number one. Number two, firms that came into existence about two years ago, you can see them donating hundreds and hundreds of crores. Now, what is that if not, as you said, probably money laundering or black money? Otherwise, a firm which, you know, you, you can see one of the firms, you know, photographs have also come. It's a, it's a small rat hole kind of a thing. But it donates nearly over a thousand crores. What is that? Is that is is that white money? Is that legal money? Is that uh, hard earned money by the corporate? The profits after sharing with the shareholders, after giving them you know the dividend and other things, is it is it that money which was you know given to a political party? After all that was taken care of, it's not. Now, if you see all that, this. You know, uh, the reasoning that, you know, it will bring the black money back doesn't wash really because it is full of black money. This is one. The second thing is, if you want to arrest black money, you don't need to make it untransparent. You don't make it, you don't have to make it into a secret deal. You know, uh, somebody goes and buys a bond and denotes it, denotes, uh, donates it to a political party, why should that, that be a secret? Why should that be uh, only information which is private to the bank and the ruling party? But what, is, what I find surprising is that the anonymity which this scheme gave, which in itself was uh, something that a lot of people opposed from the beginning, saying that this anonymity is the whole problem. I wonder why the courts did not see this before. Yes, now we are all hailing the court saying that great judgment, but this scheme started in 2018. It went on for 20, uh, for six years. We have 16,000 rupees uh, crore rupees collected. Uh, why didn't the court see this earlier? Uh, Danya, uh, as soon as the scheme was introduced, a batch of petitions were filed. It's been challenged since day one. You remember that. But then the 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 issue is uh, that you know no uh, CJI was prepared to hear this. They were so busy. 
they were busy with other cases. And I do not want to say anything more detailed about this because, you know, I don't want you and me to get into trouble. You are already running around so many courts. I know, I know it. Therefore, no, I don't... Last name now. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I'm not trying to attribute any motives, but, you know, they did not... Uh, and you see, not only that, when, when, when petitions were filed, you know, what do you expect from a court? If you if the, if you don't have time, what you could do is you know until we hear you suspend the scheme. They were not even prepared to suspend the scheme, and the ruling party went on to take advantage of the scheme for every election since mm -hmm. was it was challenged and introduced. And today, when the court was prepared to hear, look at the way the government really scrambled to stop it. it. It threw all sorts of, you know, alibis and all sorts of, uh, um, you know, reasons to say that you please don't do that. And they made the industry organizations to write. Correct. They made the Bar Council chairman to write. And subsequently, the entire, uh, the other people in the Bar Council Association, you know, the Bar Association, sorry, not Bar Council, Bar Association had to say that we have nothing to do with that. You know, why all this? Unless it is a scam, which is so very clear and which is going to hurt and completely defame the ruling party and the leadership. That is the reason why I call this a body gate. So other than the Home Minister, another comment has come from the government, which is from the Finance Minister. Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman recently said that nobody has any moral authority to speak. She was talking about the Congress and the other opposition parties because everybody has taken money. So nobody has any moral authority to question this. But you see, uh, the point here is this. Who is in a position to coerce? And who is in a position to give you favors and that is the one which has to really clinch the whole thing and polit donations to political parties is not new but is the donation given in return for a favor and who is in a position to do a favor that's one and is the donation given as a result of coercion by agencies and who is in a position to use agencies to coerce? These are the two questions. If these two questions are answered, then getting a donation is no crime and no sin, and it is not irregular. But if, like you have put together, your project has put together, you know, when is the donation given? A raid happens and a donation happens. A donation happens and a contract is awarded. You know, if you put these two together, and then you will know, prima facie, there is a lot of problem here that leads you to suspect the executive, the government, and the ruling party. Now, if the ruling party and the government and the regime, as they claim, that it has nothing to do with, you know, a quid pro quo. It has nothing to do with coercion. They all came and gave because we are the best political party in the world. If that is so, let there be an independent judicial inquiry. The judicial inquiry will go into the, at, to the bottom of the whole thing and find out when did you give, how much did you give, and is your firm of the size to give a donation of a thousand crores or 300 crores or 500 crores? And then can that be linked to some kind of a, a quid pro quo? Or can that be linked to a series of raids or an arrest? For, in, in, for instance, uh, one more thing that comes to my mind is that you know somebody who is arrested and his firm, his company gives uh, electoral bond. 
And then when that person applies for bail, the ED doesn't uh, oppose that bail. And after that, there's some more donation. And the person who was accused turns into an approver. Now, you and I can say, look, there is there's something to, to you know, suspect in this. The government and the ruling party and the ruling party spokespeople and the ministers might say, no, there's absolutely nothing. Fine. Let the, let, the, let, let, the, let the independent judicial commission go into it and then uh, investigate this. Are but, you prepared? But I want to interrupt you there. I mean, as a journalist, I, so I'm feeling a bit lost here because... Who's going to be asking the government that there should be a judicial inquiry? Now, we were the ones who put out a story that Arabindo Farmer, which is based out of Hyderabad, uh, the one of the owners, the directors of the company, Sharat Chandra Reddy, he was an accused of the Delhi liquor scam. When he was arrested, Arabindo Farmer gave five crores to BJP. When he turned approver, they gave 50 crores to BJP. The opposition has taken it up. I would say that too in a in a very half-hearted way, Aam Aadmi Party and the Congress had press meets. Beyond that, the media is not asking the BJP these questions. There is absolutely no pressure on the BJP to form any sort of inquiry or even promise one. I mean, I was a reporter even when the 2G scam broke, the Tatra scam broke. And I remember every day we were standing outside offices or houses of ministers, even the prime minister uh, uh, asking, what are you doing? What are you doing? That kind of pressure is not there. So why should the government go ahead and ask for any kind of inquiry now? Yes. Um... I mean, you, you feel that because uh, you don't see the, these kind of questions asked on your television screens, you think that there is no pressure. Is it? I mean, one of the that, biggest pressure points was the media. I'm saying when the media has taken a back step, who will do that? Because the, the media for, for some time, for, for several years, you know that, the mainstream media, the so-called mainstream media is, 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 is absolutely not asking questions. It is not critiquing the government. I'm not saying that it, it, it has to take up cudgels and fight. I'm not saying that. But at least ask questions or platform questioning, platform critique. It is not even platforming critique. And even that is very, very noticeable in the civil society today, Danya. I can tell you that. Um, you know, uh, when there are... Uh, you know, when there are so many burning issues in the, in the, in the society... For instance, price rise, unemployment, and things like that, marginalization, othering, hate, you know, violence, and these things. But the mainstream media pays a lot of attention, gives a lot of aid time to pre-wedding events. That is the kind of uh, uh, media management that we see today. Today, the government has reduced itself to headline management, every scheme or every program that they have been announcing since 2014, you know, at, at one point of time, they all sounded that they have the potential to change the face of India. For instance, say, for instance, look at Swachh Bharat, Make in India, Stand Up India, Skill India, Kelo India, you know, Beti Padao, Beti Bachao. What kind of, a, but there is no sincerity. You know, after this, the scheme is announced and launched and there was an event with next day papers carrying headlines and that evening uh, there was a debate or a discussion. After that, the scheme is completely forgotten. There is absolutely no follow-up. There is no implementation at all. Now, you know very well that even if there is a small amount of achievement, this government really gets onto the rooftops and announces it so well and it is very, very good at, you know, branding itself and, you know, uh, ad advertising and, you know, uh, magnifying whatever is, is achieved. But why is it that the, the schemes that I have uh, 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 listed, why is it that the government doesn't even talk about any one of these? And not only that, they don't talk about it uh, in the open forums, uh, Danya. Even the respective ministries, their annual reports also do not make a mention, meaningful mention of any of these schemes, their respective ministries. The reason is nothing has happened. Nothing is happening. It was not a sincere attempt. That is the reason why they don't look at it. So are you saying that the people who are impacted on the ground would take something like an electoral bond seriously this election? Because another narrative I hear all the time now is that 
you guys can report how much ever you want in electoral bonds, but nobody's bothered. Uh, on the ground, this does not impact people. On the ground, people are not going to vote out the government because of electoral bonds. Yeah, I too hear this. You know, I hear this from uh, people who are uh, uh, very staunch supporters of this regime. And I see two things in this. One, do whatever you want. You know, we are going to win. This is one. What does it mean? It means that they are not in a position to justify what has happened. Actually, it's a, it's, it is, it's, it's a form of conceding. That's one. The second thing I see is that except for putting up a brave face and brazening it out, do whatever you want, we're coming back. We, we know how to come back. You know, we have these these things or probably, you know, we, we can manage the election, whatever it is. Or even organize the split in other parties and, you know, buy MPs or whatever, because they're, they're, they're sitting on a huge kitty. Other than that, tell me, is, is there an element of, you know, taking a moral high ground and saying that, you know, it, it, it is that particular attempt, that particular narrative that you just spoke is trying to bank on, you know, these things are not intelligible to common people. They don't understand this. How do, what do they understand of, 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 of uh, electoral bond? But you see, you were there when 2G scam broke out. Do you think, can you tell me that the common person on the streets understand what is a 2G and what could be the scam or what is a CWG? They don't understand. But they do get a sense that there's something amiss in the whole thing that, you know, people have taken money and money was exchanged, favors, you know, were granted in exchange of money. This much sense, I think the common person has really got it. That is the feeling that I get, especially when I meet the youngsters. You know, I've been traveling for a long time now. I'm going to the campuses. I meet a lot of young people. I meet common people. I, I talk to them. And, and they said there's something wrong. And, you know, that is the reason why I'm able to say that, you know, there is a sense of some wrongdoing happening somewhere. That is the sense that most people have. So when the UPA was in power, like you said, yes, when the second UPA was in power, there was this uh, impression that things are not going well, even if people did not understand the nuance of every alleged scam. But this government has something which the UPA did not have, right? They have Hindutva, which they believe will, whatever said and done, will eventually un unify their voters, their core voters at least, which is something which the UPA too lacked, that whole theme of Hindutva. Uh, Danya. This Hindutva core has always been there in India. It's been there, you know, since uh, 1880s. It's nothing new. And, you know, that core has been there, whether it's 7% or 10% or 15%, you know, the, the, at the height of... Uh, Leaders like Atal Bihari Vajpayee and LK Advani, probably it was about 20-22%. And, you know, the narrative, if you go back to 2014, what was the narrative? The narrative was not Hindutva. That was taken for granted. That was there. That was the deposit that they had, like a fixed deposit. But they were looking at, you know, some addition to that. That addition was brought in by propagating a narrative that the UPA2 was... It had a policy paralysis. It was steeped in corruption, black money, you know, so many scams and a huge campaign that was um, mounted in the name of India against corruption. You know, that added. And of course, you know, the, the oratory, the, the social media, the, the propaganda blitz, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the kind of branding you know, using all the modern techniques. So the those things, those all those things together brought in this extra, which you know, the, the, the critical mass that has helped BJP 
to capture power. But then today, you know, that section which has add which was added to them since 2014, I feel and I could sense that a large part of it, if not the entire part of it, a large part, a significantly large part of it is affected by the price rise, the mismanagement of the economy and othering and uh, the violence, the sectarian violence, what is happening in Manipur, what has happened in uh, Jammu and Kashmir and, you know, the, the center state uh, relations especially the fiscal relations and uh, the stifling of the federal structure, these things at, at different levels. Prices, of course, affects everybody. Unemployment affects everybody. You know, uh, these things have taken that extra thing that was added to the BJP's core in 2014. The anti-corruption plank, that was the most important thing. And I think this Modi gate is going to completely demolish the, the the moral high ground that the BJP got onto in 2014. I want to just ask one more question about electoral bonds and then move on to the issue of unemployment. You must have read a lot of stories on electoral bonds. What, what um, stood out for you as the most concerning of them? The, the most important thing for me is the, 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 the way that the RBA was compelled to compromise. You know, that is something which is, you know, I can understand their own agencies like the ED, the CIT, the CBI, you know, uh, they are doing bidding, they are doing uh, these institutions doing the bidding of the government. But if, if it really is proved, not just a mere coincidence, but if it is proved that the RBI, RBI also caved in to pressure, then I think that is going to be the, 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 the most worrisome thing in the whole thing. For those uh, unaware, Mr. Prabhakar is talking about a story that we put out uh, along with Scroll and News Laundry, the News Minute. We've been running this project called Project Electoral Bond. One of the stories we did that is in that is about Uday Kotak, how the uh, Kotak Bank and uh, uh, Reserve Bank of India were in a legal tangle because Reserve Bank of India had issues with how much stake Uday Kotak had in Kotak Bank. So our story basically traced how money in electoral bonds were given by Kotak, a Kotak company to BJP. And at that very time, the Reserve Bank of India agrees for an out-of-court settlement. So that's what Mr. Prabhakar is hinting at. Was the Reserve Bank of India also pressurized? I want to quickly now go to the next topic, which is about unemployment. There's a very worrying international labor organization um, report which has come out, which says that more and more educated people in India are finding themselves unemployed. How uh, how bad is the situation? Uh, the data also is very confusing. What comes from India because we, the India the data from the government is that uh, as far as the total uh, numbers are concerned, we are doing better. Uh, that unemployment rates have actually come down. But is the real problem that the educated people are are more unemployed now? Okay. There are, there are, I, mean, I don't want to make it very technical because it should also be intelligible to you know people who are uh, uh, not so much into this uh, domain. Uh, let me say it as simply as possible. When do you call a person unemployed? Somebody who is able and willing to work and not finding work. It's not just the ability. It's not just uh, you know willingness. But if you are willing and able not finding work. That is the thing. And then those people are counted in the labor force. Now, if the labor force participation itself is very low, that's one. Because it's, as you know, uh, uh, labor force participation in India is, is one of the lowest. It doesn't anywhere come to even middle income uh, countries. And forget about the you know higher income countries or developed countries. That's one. The second thing is the labor participation of women is also very poor in India. Just park these two in your mind. Then I come to in from that pool, you see how many people are unemployed. And unemployed. Unemployment is, you know, somebody who is absolutely no work at all. But then, in a week, if you find a couple of days work, 
like like there is an adda kuli. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with adda kuli. You go to the center of the town or uh, 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 Chaurasta, and there are people standing there. And you know they might come and stand there every day, but you know they might find a couple of hours or you know, uh, five six hours of work per, per week, and the government doesn't count them in the pool of unemployed. That's one. And people who are underemployed are also not counted. And then the government has invented, and if you see the data, there is a rise in self-employment, self self-employed self category. They, they are not really employed. You know, they, they call themselves self-employed, or the government labels them as self-employed because you know they might sell something or you know they, they might do something, a little job, or they, they might sit in the small shop that his father owns, his mother owns, or you know, his family owns, his brother owns, but it doesn't really work. It, it there is there is no actual productivity added by this person or this person's presence doesn't add any productivity, does not even give any income. So all these things, if you do not differentiate, and then you can you can paper over these things and say that unemployment is, is not much. That's why. Now, if you see the NCRB, the National Crime Records Bureau, the highest number of people who are committing suicide are from this self-employed category, agriculturists and unemployed. So, in other words, all the three are in one category. You know, people who who have left the farming and went away to the uh, urban areas have come back now. Now, the kind of pressure that is there on the Manrega, in the last financial year, for example, I can tell you, the, the amount of money that was allocated to Manrega program for one full year was exhausted in just six months. So that is the kind of, you know, why do people settle for a minimum wage if they have a gainful employment? So all oh, this is a crisis, not a, just that. I mean, let me add this also. You know, in the beginning of 2022, there was an advertisement by the railways. I'm, I'm sure you recollect this. They have advertised for what is called NTPC jobs, non-technical preferred categories, which is nothing but manual labor, manual, you know, cleaning, washing, you know, all that kind of a thing. The number of jobs that were advertised were 35,000. And the number of applicants were for 35,000 jobs, 1 crore 25 lakhs. And recently we have seen reports, even Times of India has reported it, saying that hundreds of PhDs have applied for a normal job in Uttar Pradesh, the minimum qualification for which was fifth standard. That is the crisis. Now, then you come to the... Uh, uh, before we go to the educated unemployment, let me come to the youth unemployment. Youth unemployment in this country is one of the highest in the world. There are probably there are four or five more which are close to India. Countries like Iran, countries like Lebanon, countries like you know uh, Syria, Yemen. These are the countries which are close. You know, a country like Bangladesh, which is now in our neighborhood, its youth unemployment rate is just half of our youth unemployment rate. It is 24% in India and 12% in Bangladesh. This is what. Just park this also in your mind. The other thing that I want to say, if you if you uh, slice this 24%, the people who are between 20 and 25 years of age, the unemployment rate is somewhere around 40% or even 42%. Now, overall, it is 24%. But if you segment, if you do the segment-wise uh, check, then 2025 segment is about 42-43%. Now, this is a crisis. Among them, you now, you see, uh, the, the ILO report, the way it is reported, is that among the unemployed, that pool, about more than 60 70% were educated 
But what I am looking at it is how many among the educated are unemployed, how many among the young people are unemployed. That is the that is the right way to look at it. So the, when you said that, you know, the, the data was a bit confusing, it is confusing because it was reported as, you know, of the people who are unemployed, the, the major chunk of them are educated. That is one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is what is the rate of unemployment among the youth? What is the rate of unemployment among the educated people. This gives you a much clearer picture. That is what I've, I've put forward to you. Now, if you look at uh, the young people unemployed, their pa labor participation ratio, how many people are unemployed, underemployed, gain, not gainfully employed, and people who are you know, for, for several reasons, the government tries to say that, you know, they're not employed, but they are self-employed because you, you can't show them where they're employed. And, you know, the, the number of people who have lost regular jobs, especially since the demonetization, a very thoughtless move that the government has embarked on since demonetization has been staggeringly high. I think about you know, about you know, almost about 60 to 70 million people have lost regular salaried jobs. And, you know, regular salaried jobs is the organized sector. But the main crisis is still not in the organized sector. The main crisis is in the unorganized sector. But if you if you if you have an idea of what is the crisis in the organized sector itself in terms of employment and unemployment, club that with the unorganized sector's crisis, because you know the FMCGs continuously tell you that you know their sales are not taking off, which means there is a lot of distress, which means that the unorganized sector is not doing well, which means that you know there is a lot of poverty. In fact. You see, look at the poverty or, or hunger index. The government of India lampooned the international organizations, saying that how can they say that there is... Uh, in fact, I remember one of the ministers in the government, a senior minister, saying that, look, you know, I left Delhi early in the morning, went to one town after the interesting meeting, another time went, and I had no time to eat in between. Then, then there's a call comes and I pick up. And somebody asked on the other side, are you hungry? I said, I'm hungry. And they say, you know, India is hungry. It's not that. Things are not, you know, that kind of, a, you know, silly and simplistic. If, if the government of India genuinely believes that there is no hunger, I want to ask them, if that is the case, why did the prime minister go on to announce free ration for 80 crore people? And... It is not for one year that the Prime Minister has announced. At a time, he announced it for five years, which means normally what happens is that, you know, if you have some measures in place, you would say, okay, let us take a call after one year. Hmm. Because you have no measures in place and you're not confident that you can really address this problem, that you announce it for five years at one go. That's one. The second thing is, I think it's, it's just yesterday or day before, you had the chief economic advisor saying that this is this is not the uh, remit of the government. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you about that. The chief economic advisor, during the, uh, when this report was unveiled, he said that the government cannot be finding all these jobs that other sectors to have to. What does it mean? You see, with the government announcing free food for 80 crore people, free ration, food grains, for five years at a time. And the uh, CEA is saying this. And, you know, the, the, the original mm -hmm. promise of... Uh, Two crore jobs per annum, per annum. That is not uh, uh, anywhere to be seen. And then the kind of rural distress and the kind of you know people data that is coming out from the ILO, from the ministry, um, and you know on the ground you see that you know one crore twenty five lakh people applying for thirty five thousand jobs, and you know PhD is applying for a job which you know, the the minimum qualification of which is about fifth standard or so. What is it? It shows that the economy, especially in terms of hunger, in terms of employment, in terms of uh, rural incomes, is in deep distress, is in deep trouble.
Not only that, Dhanya, the, the unorganized sector, the incomes are stagnant. They are stagnant in such a way that, you know, if you want to see what are the indications of that, that, you know, you have your SUV sales rising, but your two-wheeler sales really tepid. It means that, you know, people who are doing very well are doing very well. You have a huge rise in the number of billionaires in this country in the last 10 years or so. That's one. The second thing, you know, Thomas Piketty was a very respected uh, economist uh, working out of uh, Paris. Um, he runs an inequality lab and he has done massive work on inequality, you know, world-class work. And their lab has recently studied India and has come out with this finding that 1% of India's population, which means rich, they are cornering about 22% of income. And they control and they own nearly 40% of the assets. And bottom uh, 50% have very, very meager incomes and very, very meager assets. So the, on the one hand, you have inequality, you have unemployment, you have hunger, you have rural distress. Credit offtake in the rural areas is, is very tepid. It's not taking off. Then you have rural wages stagnating. This is the picture of New India. And juxtapose this with the, the, the kind of propaganda blitz that the government talks about. You know, we are the fastest growing economy. We are the fifth largest economy. No, fifth largest economy, but they don't talk about the per capita income terms. You know, and if, if we are the fifth largest economy, overtaking the United Kingdom, you know, that is the government narrative. You and I agree, everybody agrees that the United Kingdom is, is one of the developed countries, isn't it? Now, if you have overtaken the United Kingdom, how is it that you are saying that by 2047 I will be a developed country? You are already a developed country. Isn't it? Because if you have overtaken a developed country, what are you? A, a, an underdeveloped country or a developed country cannot overtake a, a developed country. By the very fact that it has overtaken a developed country like the United Kingdom, by definition, India should be a developed country today, which means that there is some mismatch somewhere. Now, if, 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 if the government figures are taken seriously, they are talking about you know over 8%, 8.4% 8 GDP growth uh, last quarter. Now, if you look at the consumption, the general, you know, the general acceptable uh, thing in the in the in the circles of the economists is this macroeconomists is this that you know the the growth of consumption and the growth of the economy if there is a difference between 0.5% and 1% it is acceptable okay you are know, accounting probably there are there's some anomalies and you know there's some gaps but you know in india the growth of consumption is recorded at 3%. And the economy growth is recorded and told to us at 8.4%. What does it mean? It means that there is no consumption, but there is growth. There is no employment, but there is growth. There is a huge rural distress, but there is growth. Real wages, wages in the unorganized sector are not increasing, they're not growing, but you have 8.4% growth. We, how do you fit in these narratives? I just want to know. I want, I want, I, I do not want uh, the, the, the CA, the, 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 the supposed to be the brain behind, the economic brain behind the, the government to say that, you know, the, it, it's not the duty or it's not the work of the government to provide employment. If that is the case, then whom do I look to? Do I look to the government? 
because this government has come to power in 2014 by promising two crore jobs per annum promising doubling of the farmers income farm income now today what is the what is the state of affairs in the rural sector in agriculture people are flocking to mandrega mandrega which this regime has really ridiculed it did not want this to be continued actually initially if you remember that is the kind of economy that we are in today now this coupled with the kind of kind of uh, scam that we see today you know there is no performance and there is no moral high ground loss of moral high ground and you know continuous badgering by the government that you know we are now vishnu guru we have we everybody is looking at us as you say that you know uh, we have uh, um, we have we become fifth largest economy and all that kind of thing. india's prestige has grown you know when when the reality and the branding they do not match then the trouble starts what i find is that you know one is of course is the the modi gate that i talked about the other one that you know is that you know the prime minister willingly i don't know whether by design or you know by just default or you know it, it's the nature we do not know but he is continuously overexposed for the last 10 years so much so that today when the performance doesn't match the kind of exposure the kind of branding the kind of build up then i think a fatigue sets in i think a fatigue had set in uh, they'll talk like that he will talk like that you know that kind of i think along with modi gate you have a modi fatigue these two are going to cost very dearly to this regime and to this uh, government this is what i gather when i look at it when i observe and analyze when i you know bring things together you know what i said is nothing new you know all this what i did is only to you know bring them all together juxtapose them and give put them in a context give them some kind of a background so that you you will know where the country is going and what could be the felt experience lived experience of the people and you say that what upa2 did not have this government has in the sense of hindutva but i say that that's always been there in the indian body politic it's nothing new and i say that it's always been there if you want to go back it's there even 1818 even even since the third maratha war when the marathas were comprehensively defeated by the british these things continued 1880s 1890s of course it, it was much more and of course 1925 hindu mahasabha and uh, rashtriya swayamsevak sangh and you know all those uh, 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 streams they've all been there it's always been there i think it will be there but the point is those ideas those narratives were overwhelmed by the secular progressive with scientific temper that kind of a narrative let me add one more point you know when when the the the, the present regime probably does not like the constitution especially it does not like you know the 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 secular aspect the liberal aspect you know the the federation kind of an aspect of uh, the our constitution but you know all the this constitution it was you know thoroughly debated when was it debated when the country was in the throes of partition when it was facing the the heat of partition the violence of partition even then outside there is a lot of violence people who are going in and coming going out and coming into the you know constituent assembly Uh, holding positions outside in the government like sardar vallabhai patel and you know so many people jawaharlal nehru and other people they were coming coming back into the constituent assembly facing dealing with those problems but still stuck by this value of diversity 
secularism, liberalism. They did not want India to become another Pakistan. They did not want India to be defined, India's citizenship to, to be defined on the basis of religion. But these are the things that we see today slowly and slowly coming in. So that is the a political crisis. Coupled with that is the economic crisis. That is how I see. So thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Parakala Prabhakar. Modi fatigue plus Modi gate. That is what will uh, set the narrative for this election, uh, you tell me. Well, we'll come back uh, and have a conversation with you again, perhaps after the elections to see what happened? Did things go right, wrong? Uh, did Modi fatigue and Modi get to really work against the BJP and more things? Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you, Danya. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.